the Illuminati. We I've had people on here and they talk about the Illuminati. Do you believe in it? No. <laughs> Literally, people come on and think it's real. Yeah. I'm rich as. F I'm Jewish. Nobody asked me to join any of them secret societies, right? right. Nobody. I'm like, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Can I at least get an invite to a cocktail party? All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice? Got to roll the dice. That's why. All my life, I've been grinding all my life. Yeah. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice? Got to roll the dice. That's why. All my life. Hello, welcome to another episode of Club Shay Shay. I am your host, Shannon Sharp. I'm also the proprietor of Club Shay Shay. The guy that's stopping by for conversation on the drink today is one of America's most famous and successful entrepreneurs. He created the world's first streaming platform. He's one of the top 10 Wall Street trades of all time. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest single E-Trade transaction. One of the most influential people in cable and sports industry. Self-made multi-billionaire, savvy entrepreneur, internet pioneer, genius financier, highly respected businessman, a cele celebrated sports owner. He helped the Dallas Mavericks win their first NBA title in 2011. Primetime television star, he was a shark on the award-winning TV show Shark Tank. As an executive producer for Academy Award-winning movies, best-selling author, avid philanthropist, humanitarian, and mogul. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Cuban. What's up, Shay? I love Mark that Cuban. intro, man. <laughs> when you hear all those things, you like, damn. I know. I'm like, no more. Enough, enough, <laughs> enough. You're just telling me I'm old. That's all. You drink, Mark? Uh, yeah, do I drink? Yes. Okay, well, you know, hey, this is my own cognac. Uh, it's called Shea by La Portier. Uh -huh. You know anything about Kanye? Yeah, a little bit, but I'm a sipper, right? I'm not like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I ain't, I ain't expecting you to take this into the dome, Mark. So <laughs> you, you, I didn't like say it. I never have. I'm just saying. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate you. Oh, so much for being a sipper. <laughs> yeah. It was just a tiny one. <laughs> so let's get right into it. Your big acquisition this offseason was Clay Thompson. Yeah. Obviously, you got Luka. We know what Luka is. You have Kyrie, a guy that can take, make big shots, tremendous handles. How were you able to convince Clay to come to Dallas when his dad wanted him to go to L.A.? He grew up as a Lakers fan. Kobe was his idol. How did you convince him, join us in Dallas? I mean, credit goes to Nico and Kyrie. NJ Kidd, right? They, they know him. They played with him. They understand him. And that's literally why we brought Nico Harrison in, because of his relationships with players. Okay. And so they went out and uh, spent time with him, got to know him better. And really, and I think Clay was ready for a move, right? Mm -hmm. You know, all the, the grief he got last year, particularly the way it ended. So the timing was right. And, you know, kudos to, Kay, to Clay for being willing to make the move. And kudos to Nico, J. Kidd, and, and Kai for making it happen. Is it hard to convince players when they've had some such success in one locale and they've been there for an extended period of time and that's their identity they're known he's always going to be known as a warrior no matter what happens if they win a title here he'll still be known as sure. a warrior is it really hard to convince players to join a new franchise when they've been associated with one franchise for so depends long depends if they're the number one guy or number two guy or number three guy okay Right. If you're number one, like Steph's not going anywhere. Right. <laughs> you're right. You can understand. You know, yeah. now LeBron's moved around right. just for different reasons, but um, the, the number two guy, if, if it's not going the way you want, then yeah, the door is open, but it takes somebody who's special, um, somebody who's got the confidence in themselves, somebody who's got the ambition, and somebody who really has got something to prove. Right. And Clay's got a lot to prove, which is great because those are the kind of guys you, you want, want on your squad, right? Because they're going to go, they're going to work harder than ever to to prove people wrong. Mm -hmm. You come off one of your best seasons since you won the NBA title. You get to the NBA Finals. Luka had an outstanding year. I think he finished top three in the MVP. Kyrie was sensational. Why weren't you guys able to get over that hump against the Boston Celtics? You lose that series 4-1. Celtics are good. They were very good. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, they didn't have a lot of weaknesses. And so, um, and in order to beat them, we had to make a lot of threes. Mm -hmm. And we just didn't. You know, our... Our three-point shooting wasn't up to par where it was during the playoffs or the regular season. We couldn't get stops like we needed to. And we couldn't get the rim to the rim the way we needed to. When when Jalen Brown is blocking shots at the rim and being a rim protector, you know it's not your day. So, you know, credit to them. But, you know, adding Clay, adding Najee, I mean, we got better. Right. You all this the following the previous offseason, you added Kyrie. 
you you know you trade make the trade for him, but you sign him, re-sign him in, in free agency. How would you? How did you know that he and Luca would play the play so well together? Because Luca needs the ball, Kyrie needs the ball to do what he's done, but he can play off the ball. How did you know that? They'll work together. Because they're both basketball savants, right? They understand the game. They know how to play. They know what it takes to win. They complement each other in a lot of ways. Um, you know, Luca's big, strong, not so quick, where Kyrie's quick handles. I mean, they both got handles, right? Yes. Top, out of the world handles, but just plays the game a little differently. And when you have a backcourt that can complement each other and both are willing to, um, let the other guy lead when the time is right. Correct. That's when it's going to work. Like when we first traded for him, they were they couldn't figure each other out because they hadn't had a preseason together. And then you know last year it took a little time. I mean we didn't get it right at the beginning, but by the end of the year they were playing off each other great. And it was like because uh, you know. Luca just loves to start a game by taking over. Right. And then Kai is fourth quarter Kai, right? And if Kai's rolling, Luca's like, here you go. And if Kai's not rolling, he goes, right. give me the ball. It's right. my turn, okay. right? And yes. when they got that respect and that relationship, that's when everything changed. But you know, Kyrie had a history of what transpired. I mean, Cleveland, and it was Boston, and it didn't work out with uh, the Nets. And they had. So how do you deal with a player that, you know, might, it might not have worked out over here. It might not have worked out over there. It might not have worked out over there. But you know what? I believe in this player and it's going to work out over here. How do you how do you assess that, Mark? You talk to him and you talk to people around him. You watch what happens, you know, how their actions are. When you watch Kyrie, before he came to the Mavs, even, when you watch Kyrie after the game, you know, you see you see him in football, right? There's guys who will swap jerseys, yeah. slap each other, right, and walk out the door and never talk to each other again. Correct. Kyrie is one of those guys, like, he's going to hug you. Embrace he's, it. Yeah, he's going to hug you like he's known you for 20 years, and you guys are first cousins. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And that says something when guys are getting that close to each other. And so when you talk to players, they loved him. Yes. Nobody had a bad word to say about Kyrie that ever stepped on the court. Um, and so to me, that was all we needed to know. Okay. And then from there, all the things you said, well, okay, what went wrong in Boston? What went wrong um, in Brooklyn? A lot of that is maturity, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of it was circumstances too, right? How often is COVID going to hit, right. you know, and lead to those circumstances? And what we learned was you just let Kai be Kai, okay. you know, and I love talking to the guy. Mm -hmm. And I say this all the time, like, you know, if you go back to your college days and you're sitting in the dorm and you're hanging out with friends, there's a couple guys that just want to get trashed, right? There's a couple guys that want to get trashed and talk about girls, right? <laughs> and then you all talk about sports. Kai's the dude that's sitting there wanting to talk about world peace, okay. right? Why aren't we fixing this? You know, how do we end hunger? He's just got that, he's got a heart of gold. He's got a huge heart and he wants to help people, you know? And it, even if you look at his social media, it's about his tribe, right? It's about the people around him and his how he community. can lift people up, right? Yeah. His community. And and that, once we saw that, I mean, it, to me, it was, it was easy to, to make that decision. When you hear people like, man, they're misunderstood. What was your perception of Kyrie before you actually got around Kyrie and found out what type of genuine person that Honestly, he is? Honestly, before I did the work, I thought he was a team killer. Okay. Right? I was okay. just like, because I never talked. There was no point. There was no reason for me to talk to people about him. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, hey, if he doesn't want to play when the Mavs come to town, great. Right? right? If things don't work out on another team, great. But, you know, when the opportunity to trade for him came, it's like, okay, let's do the work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Nico did the work. Jay Kidd knew him. Um, Nico knew him for years. And it was like, okay, let me talk to folks. And everybody loved him. And so then you looked at the organizations he was at and, you know— um, that didn't help the situation. Yeah, right. And so, I mean, I knew all these owners, right? And I knew yeah. the circumstances. And, and so, you know, it, it wasn't a hard decision. Right. What, when you sit down and talk to Kai, and you mentioned it earlier, like you look at his social media feed, and he's talking about things that normal guys his age probably not talk, talking not about. Okay. But when he got dropped by some of these major sponsors, what, what, did, you, what did you share with him? I was like, can I help? And, and obviously, you know, when it comes to shoes, which is big money off court, yeah. we got Nico Harrison right there, right. right? And so Nico gave him a lot of guidance and support. He had talked to him and worked with him at Nike. So Nico was great. And, you know, I talked to Kai about business and he was just like, Mark, I just want to be myself, lead the way I want to lead and be creative. And he found a great deal, right? And he's been making it work. Right. If you notice the deals he signed since he came to us, there's no problems, right? There's no issues because we just let Kai be Kai. And when you do that, good things happen. Right. 
Now, is it true that when Giannis was a free agent, you did you want to try and try and something? Because I'm reading out, it says like you passed on Giannis. No, okay, two different things, right? So when Giannis was getting drafted, right, right, the that's only, when you passed. That's when we passed, right? Because we had Dirk, and this was like 2012, I think it was, or 2013, and we would just won the championship two years ago, and so one of, some of our people wanted to go for Giannis. Okay, I wanted to trade down, and we ended up getting Shane Larkin, not because so much of Shane, um, who could play, but we needed that cap room to go out and try to sign somebody right. to to propel Dirk. We wanted to go for the, the gold again. Get another one. Right. We wanted to get another one. So, you know, but it's just the way it worked out. And had we gotten Giannis, we'd never gotten Luca. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So is that, how do you make how do you how do you do that, uh, Mark? Because you're like, okay, there's this guy here, and we have a superstar already on the team, and we're trying to maximize because he's not going to play another 10 years. Right. So we want to maximize this. So how do you really determine? Because you look at Giannis like, damn, if we don't have you, Luke. But remember, remember, so Giannis coming out, there were like, I, I vividly remember, there were two VHS tapes of him <laughs> playing in the Greek League. That was all they had to show me. These, you know, <laughs> you know, like the old school tapes, if you went into a yard, yard yes. sale, right, and you find these tapes, yeah. you know, when it's got lines and everything, yes. and it looks like some, you know, someone's mom shot it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it was, right. right? And look, he got drafted at 13, I think, yeah. or something like that. And so, you know, it wasn't like every other team knew about it either. Right. But, you know, you have to respect Dirk. You have to respect what he's done for us. And I already know, like, Dirk, if we had just, you know, instead of going for it in free agency, if we had just said, okay, this rookie's going to be great, he would be like, what a shit show. <laughs> With all love, right? Because yeah, yeah. Dirk's all love. But, you know, so, you know, just out of respect to Dirk, it was my it was my final decision. And, and um, we went for it. And we didn't get the free agents we wanted, but that was the plan. Does the buck... Has the buck always stopped on Mark Cuban's day? Yeah, it's got to, right? It was my team. You know, it was my responsibility, my final decisions for better or worse. Right. Because I heard Jerry say, Jerry says, no one can run the Cowboys better than I can as a GM. Is that how you feel? Um, you no, there's probably a lot of people who can run it better. And obviously, <laughs> someone's going to get the chance now. But, right. um, but Jerry, you know, Jerry and I had a, a different, and the difference is, between us is Jerry saw the whole thing as a business. Right. Right. And when he talks about running this thing as a business and as a football team, he's right. Right. And they've gotten 12 and five, like three straight years. Right. So it's not like they suck. Right. right? Correct. And you know how hard it is to get over the hump. Absolutely. Right. It takes some luck and it, you, you know, you're playing against Mahomes, who's like the Michael Jordan in some <laughs> respects of quarterbacks, you right. know, then it was Brady before him. Right. right? Um, and so it, I, I'm not disagreeing with Jerry. I just think you got to give more credit to luck. Because luck has more impact than probably anything I could do or anything Jerry can do. Wow. Okay. So have you had conversations with Jerry about, well, Jerry, I don't know. Maybe you let, you know, let such and such. Maybe it's a different eye. No, I've had conversations with him in the past, mm -hmm. um, but not about players, right? Because right? I don't know shit about football players. When it comes. <laughs> I mean, I got my own fantasy football stuff. And right. my, my son, Jake, is just all about fantasy football, right? right? Um, but... Yeah, you, you've got to you've got to live it to make those kind of decisions. But I've talked to him in the past about coaching decisions and stuff. But that was probably ten years ago. Okay. This is Michael Finley, uh, Grant Williams, they tell the story. But I want to get to Luca. I believe if Luca were to like train in the offseason and get himself in tip top shape, I don't think Luca realized he's great. I'm talking. Mm -hmm. about he has a trans he's transcendent. He's historically great. But I don't think Luca realized how great he can be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look. We all mature as we get older, mm -hmm. right? And this going into a sixth year, he learned he learned what it takes to get to the finals for the first time. And that tells you a lot. It's like with Dirk. When we lost in 2006 in the finals to Miami, Dirk's attitude changed completely. Wow. Yeah, Dirk just became a different human in terms of preparation. I mean, literally like no alcohol during the season, which... Was it how we used to be? <laughs> Trust me. You know, no sweets, okay. right? no fried food yeah. during the season. Just complete about face on how he approached um, his profession. Mm -hmm. And Luke is smart like that, too. Now, you know, I, I haven't talked to him this offseason about all what that about kind of hookah? stuff. What's that? What about the hookah? Hey, let me just tell you this. <laughs> I know one guy who's about seven foot and it is a Hall of Famer who introduced me to hookah, yeah. right? The one time I've tried it and um, he ain't slowing down and he's like 37. <laughs> so I'm not going to judge there. Okay. 
Um, what do you think about hookah? I have never tried it. Yo, you never have? Yeah, yeah. I've done it once. Twice. Twice. You like it? Nah. No, if I've only done it twice, that tells you. That tells you no yeah. So tell us the story about Grant Williams. You uh, you signed him in free agent from the uh-huh. Celtics. And I guess he's, Michael Finley tells the story that he's trash talking Luca in practice. Yeah. Were you there that day? I wasn't there that day, but I heard all the stories, obviously. So what, so what happened to the best, what were you, what was relayed to you? Oh, you know, Grant, Grant was trying to define himself. Grant's a great guy, right? I still keep in touch with him. I like him a lot. And he was trying to define his role with the Mavericks. Mm-hmm. You know, he wasn't going to be the best player, but he was going to be a role player that that had to fit in, made threes. But he was kind of like the enforcer. And he also wanted to be kind of the adult on the court, you know, and and – with Luca, it just didn't go over well at all. When you start trash talking Luca, right. that's never going to end well. Like if I've trash talked him, like in fun, he gives me the stink eye. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you are not doing that to Luca. And Grant found out the hard way. <laughs> How did there, when you said because um, like you said he's going uh, uh, Luca's going into his sixth season. Dirk played twenty seasons with you, the only franchise that he's ever played with. You say, yeah, right now. Um, Luca's the best player. You really believe that right now that he's a better player than Dirk's ever? Yeah, been? yeah. I mean, Dirk, remember, the league has changed. Right. You know, and Dirk, the skills he brought, and even more than his skills, the mindset. Mm-hmm. Dirk is one mentally tougher than any human I've ever met in my life. You know, whether it's dealing with pain, prep, because you know better than anybody, right? It's what you do off the court. Correct. Off, what you do off the field that's more, that defines what you do. Mm-hmm. If you don't do it off, you know, mentally, physically, intellectually, right? Learning all the things you need to do, your football IQ, your basketball IQ, it doesn't matter how talented you are, right? We've seen, we've both seen talented guys just flame run right out. through, flame out in a minute. And so, you know, Dirk had that mindset that was stronger than maybe anybody other than Michael Jordan. Right. And that's, you know, Luca, on the other hand, in terms of actual skill and killer instinct, Luca can handle the ball. Dirk needed somebody for to get him get the, him ball. the ball. That's the only reason, right? If Dirk was, if Dirk came out now, right, and he'd have the skills and the handles, right? Because, you know, like... Kids today, they watch on Instagram, they watch on TikTok, all the drills and all the handles, and they see Steph, and they see Luca and Kyrie. And so they all in me. Dirk would have been out with all those handles. and would yeah, have been unfair. A whole different So way. basically, he'd been Kevin Durant before Kevin Durant. For because sure. Kevin Durant got handles that could shoot the ball. They're seven foot tall, could shoot the ball like Dirk. So basically, exactly. he'd, have been, he'd yeah. have been KD before KD. For, he would have been, right? And and then some. Um, and that's no disrespect to KD. Right. Who was that first person to get me that hookah? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you um when Lucas contracts up, he's gonna have the biggest contract in NBA yeah, history. Sure. Do you believe we're gonna get to a point in time, I don't know how soon, probably because of where it's going, that we're gonna see a, 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 a an NBA player with a billion dollar contract? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. A billion mark. Yeah, but I mean that presumes that TV keeps on going up the way it is. Yeah. But you're gonna see a hundred million dollars a year. Here shortly. Wow. Because if the TV contract has 10% increases in the cap, the way the CBA works, right? And you saw Steph, you know, had 62 million for one year. Yeah. Right? I mean, when Luca and Tatum and all these guys, man, they're Tatum young. just got what? Tatum just got what? Like 400? Something. So Luca's about to get a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. And it's going to go crazier, like this year, this coming year is still old CBA, old TV money, right? Mm-hmm. Once that new TV money get, kicks in, like, they'll be making more money a year than I will. These guys are going to be making, like, I don't care how many billions you have, like, I don't have a real job, right? right. <laughs> you know, and so I'm not making a mil- $100 million every year, right? Right. You're going to have, you're going to have players making more than the owners. Wow. And that's okay, right? There is no league without them, right? That's what makes basketball, the NBA, different than every other sport, right? You know, you couldn't recognize 50 of 53 guys on an NFL roster if they walked in the door, right? right? NBA, right, particularly if you play 2K, you knew all 15 guys and the two-way guys too, yes. right? And that's unique. You don't have that in baseball. You don't have that in soccer You have an, or the NHL. That's unique. They are the league and they earn every penny of it. 
As a former NFL player, I know a thing or two about high performance, and that's why I drive the BMW 7 Series. This car has everything I need. It's big enough, comfortable enough, and luxurious enough to meet even my high expectations. When I'm behind the wheel of the BMW, I'm not just driving a car. I'm driving legacy. What I love most is the precision engineering, cutting edge technology, and unmatched style, whether it's spacious interior, the powerful engine, or the smooth ride. BMW makes sure every detail is on point. I trust BMW to deliver the ultimate driving experience, and I know you will too. So why wait? Head over to BMWUSA.com, check out models like the Sporty X3, the all-electric i4, build your dream car today, and join me in experiencing luxury and performance that only the ultimate driving machine can offer. Well, obviously, there's been a lot of fuss because the streaming is really taking this thing over. I mean, you have Amazon. And remember when you said, you know, started the first streaming platform? Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's go back to that. I read a quote, uh, probably about, I was probably 22, 23. They says, a genius sees things that no one else sees and hits the bullseye. The streaming platform. Mark, how could you have foreshadowed this is where it's heading? Yeah, it was easy, actually. I mean, it made perfect sense to me. I'd been in the technology business for a long time, okay. right? And my buddy, Todd, and actually our start the building we started in was next door there, two doors down. And we're like, look, this internet stuff, there's going to be multimedia at some point, right. right? Let's start with audio, and eventually it'll get to video. And we're like, okay, is anybody else doing this? No. Okay, let me buy a computer. I did, bought another computer, put in the second bedroom of my house. And I was like, let's just grind it out. And we started going to every radio station, every sports league. Like, we just got all the rights and locked them up. We were YouTube before YouTube. Wow. And and really, it, it, it was hard to do. But in hindsight, I was shocked no one else had done it before. Wow. And you look back at it. So when you sold that first company, you're like, did you like, damn, that was, that, that was, that was easy. Do you, do you start a company with the hopes of selling it? No, never. Right. I always start a company with the hopes of fucking things up, right. <laughs> and trying to disrupt things, you know? So like, I remember when we started, it was audio net before it was broadcast.com. And people were like, well, what's the mission on, you know, what's your personal goal? And I'm like, I want to be the next Ted Turner because Ted Turner had TBS, yeah. right. Started CNN, CNN, right. And then he was, you know, doing, um, the racing, the yacht racing mm -hmm. or whatever, the yeah. world, um, world cup. Yeah. World no, cup. No, no. Uh, what was the cup? What is it? Um, America's uh, cup. America's cup. Right. And, or something like that. But in any event, and he has champagne everywhere. He has hot girls everywhere, right? And he's like managing the Braves when he wanted to. I'm like, come that's on, what that's what be. I want to be, yeah. right? I want to have fun. And um, so the goal, though, was to see if we can turn this thing and actually at some point in time replace television. Mm -hmm. And it happened slower than we expected, but it's happening now. Mm -hmm. And that that was the vision. Is Lenny, well... Because it seems like people just like go linear for live sporting events. It's like everything else is kind of like the Netflix, the Amazon, right. is the Tubi's, the all that other stuff is on like streaming platforms. Yep. Is that where we're so in the next five to ten years, Mark, where are we gonna be? That's where we're gonna be, right? Because linear television is struggling. You know, you know, you know, you know ESPN used to have 110, 120, 110 million subscribers. Mm -hmm. Now they're down in the 70s or something like that. And that's changed, right? You know this industry well, right? And it's harder even for Fox Sports and those guys. And so the money's just not going to be there. It used to be like there, were, there was a time where it was like, okay, what's on, what are the new shows on ABC, CBS, and NBC, right? And See, you were used to be must watch, watch TV. You set your clock like, man, I'm going to go watch Friends. Right. I'm going to watch Everybody Loves Raymond or all the, whatever. And Shark Cheers, Tank. And whatever. Shark. Yeah. And Shark Tank. Yeah, Shark Tank. Yeah. <laughs> they do, hey, did you know that was going to be a No, season? I thought it was going to suck, but um, we'll, we'll get there in a sec, right? <laughs> okay. So, but... Those shows, like, are scripted shows. They're not going to linear television anymore. No. They're going to streaming, right? Netflix and Peacock and Max and those guys. And so, you know, now the linear stations are trying to do all sports, you know, and, and that's their angle. Um, and on Shark Tank, literally, when I, I got asked to be a guest shark, and they're like, we'll give you three episodes. I'm like, cool, I'll come on. This show's not going to last. Right. I'm just going to go on there. <laughs> Literally. I'll be on TV for three shows. Dude. Right, that's exactly right. I'll be on, you know, I'll, I'll be on network television on ABC for three shows. I'll raise some hell, show people I know what I'm talking about with business, and we'll see what comes next. Right. And the next thing you know, bam. Of course, I take all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> this 
media rights deal. Uh-huh. Obviously, TNT is a, has been at it. It's an institution. All right, Chuck, Kenny, Charles, and uh, excuse me, Kenny, um, Shaq, uh, Ernie, and, Ernie, and, yeah, and Shaq, yeah. and Shaq. So obviously, they're an institution, and yep. after this year. They're not going to be there unless NBC or ESPN or one of these, them. Amazon, somebody picks them up. How difficult is that? Because they say, well, we're going to sue because uh, uh, we had right of first refusal, whatever the case may be. Yeah. You don't have to get into too deep into it, Mark. But so what's going on with that? Did you know that the media rights deal was going to be basically like 3X, 4X, yeah. 10X? Yeah, because we were the last big media deal available. So think about what we just said, right? How do you keep linear TV alive? Yes. Right? You need sports. Mm-hmm. And the NFL is already locked up. So who's next? And so if you're going to stay alive, you needed us. And then when streaming wanted some of it to be able to carve out just some, like Amazon carves out, um, Peacock carves out some, it's like, why would we not take that money? Yeah. You know, and I mean, 51% goes to the players. So they were happy about it too. Absolutely. I think the thing is, is that these platforms, the streaming platform, the Netflix, the YouTubes, they want to be channels. They want to be taken serious and you cannot do it. Without sports. No, you can't. Live sporting events. Because that's what's kept them alive, right? The the NFL, and to a lesser extent, the NBA and Major League Baseball, you know, the other sports are helping, but they're living on the NFL. Yes. Right? And the NFL is just more and more and more and more. But at some point, there'll be a tipping point, right? Because it costs more to get a um, linear television um, network than it does just a streaming, Mm -hmm. right? Because the cable network, the satellite network, they're having to pay all this money and they're having to charge consumers all that money. Mm -hmm. That's not going to stay or stick around forever. And they're all, yeah, it's not sustainable the way it is today. And all those platforms are trying to figure out the right way to do it. If Mark Cuban was an NBA player today, how would he spend his money how would he invest his money? How would you, how would, what type of business, if you're an NBA player, so right. you're coming in and so you don't have the business augment that you have. Right, as, as just order. chill, right, yeah. right, right, right. So if I'm just a two-way player, yeah. right? If I'm a two-way <laughs> player, I'm living like a student. Okay. Because uh-huh. you don't know how long it's going to last, Correct. right? Okay. And one of the hard things is, you know, like I never, I didn't grow up with money. I, I didn't have shit. And, and so, um, it's hard when you first get money to understand what it is, mm-hmm. right? How how much do you have and what can you actually do? Because you you hear all these stories and you think big, and you know how that goes, right? But you don't think it's going to happen to you. Right, right. And you hear about the stories about people losing it all. Mm-hmm. So I, I tell guys all the time, save your money. You know, one broken ankle and it's over. Mm-hmm. It's over. And if I'm somebody making 40, 50, 60 million, then I'm hiring somebody that knows what they're doing, but it ain't going to be one of my friends. Okay. Right, it can't not be your friend because your friend wants to be your friend. My money guy needs to make me money, yes. right? And it can't be a friend of a friend of a friend. It's got to be somebody who's done it for big time people and knows their shit, mm-hmm. right? Because that's that's the other place guys get tied up. Well, that's my guy. He's been with me forever. I want to take care of him. He wants to get into finance. Oh no 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 no! no. Can, you can still he can still be with me. He you can, can be your be friend, right? Yeah. I'll take you to dinner. Yeah. I'll you know I'll buy yeah. you. I'll I'll pay you some money to take care of things, right? right? But um, you can't you know. Don't invest in the restaurant. Don't invest in the clothing label. Don't invest in the liquor company. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, what, or music, right? That is the death, right? So it's not so much now, right? But in the early 2000s, um, early 2010s, everybody wanted a music label, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody was either going to be a rapper or they were going to, um, you know, have a label and sign Sorry. rappers because that's what, you know, what, what was going on. And you know one athlete's label that's done any good? No, I don't. I don't. You know, clothing companies? No. It's hard. It is. Right? Those businesses are hard because there's no barriers to entry. You want to start a clothing? It's funny because I get people talk to me all the time. So I've got this brand name, right? Let's get busy, LGB. And you think you're going to start a clothing line based (laughs) off of LGB? Right? Or, you know, I've got this one song that I'm going to do, right? And it's going to listen to this. Isn't this the best song you? It's not that easy. (laughs) As the Dallas Mavericks owner, obviously your signature player before Luka, and you've had some great players at the Mavericks, but it's been dirt. Yeah, of course. What has Dirk meant to you and this organization? Everything. He is the organization. He's the definition of the Dallas Mavericks. Um, 
And again, not just what he did for us on the court, but who he is off the court. Dirk's that guy that's going to the hospitals without being asked, that's, you know, taking time with kids, visiting them. You know, when he has a special event, and and he's had many, he's making sure kids are coming, and he's just got, you know, he's got that heart. People know he loves Dallas, and as a result, Dallas loves him. And that's what I've, that's the interesting thing, Mark, because a lot of these international players, like when they're done, they go back to their respective countries. Dirk has remained, he's German, but he's remained. He goes back and forth. He, he does, goes back. Yeah, he does. Yeah, but you're right. He's, he's Dallas, right? But um, he stays here. He lives here. Just built a house here. You know, does charity continuously. You, you know, you can take, you can't take the Dallas out of Dirk now. Is it true that he brought his meals on the road in aluminum foil? Some, not all, right? <laughs> Some, yeah. No, I do remember that, right? Um, he'd get it because he wanted healthier stuff, right? Right, right so he, yeah, I forgot all about that. So, yeah, so he would get things specially made for him because he wasn't going to eat anything because you know what it's like on a team plane. There's fried chicken everywhere, yes. you know, whatever the players just love to eat, right? right? And he was like, no, I'm no more fried food. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Why have European players... Really, if you look at what the last six MVPs, it's been European players. You got Jokic with two, three. You got Giannis with two. You got Joel and B with one. Why have they start? Why have we seen this shift to where European players are starting to dominate? Yeah, the I NBA mean, just world? in the draft, and two reasons. One, the rest of the world is bigger than us. Right, so we've got 30, 330 million. Yeah, there's eight billion people in the world, right? <laughs> so they got sell for sale. Yeah, so there, there's more options available, right? Particularly now with Africa and India, and you know, um, I love I, whenever I think India now, I like that song, Ten Toes In. You know yeah. that what I'm talking. About? Um, but anyways, I digress. Um, but so there's just more people, and then the training methods are different. Um, there's no equivalent of AAU. And, you know, kids here, like my son or whoever, they're playing game after game after game, but hardly practice. Wow. You know, and over there, there's two practices a day, and you might play one, two, three, maybe three times a week. And so the focus is on developing skills. And no matter, you know, here, even still, we kind of pigeonhole people into certain positions. You're right. big, right? You get down on the block. The right? biggest guys you played the, the four or the five. Right, right. And so, um, and that's changing some, but they don't really work on all the skills or even more importantly, the basketball IQ. You know, and I, and I take that back a little bit because kids now are far more skilled um, at the high school level, at the junior high level, you see the handles, right? Like my son's got handles. Like he's got my athleticism, unfortunately for him, but my son's got handles. Like, <laughs> oh God, that's going to work. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I used to be able to dunk, but still, um, he still got my athleticism. And so, um, but his handles are yeah. off the charts. Right. right. And it's no big deal. All the guys on his team can handle, um, and they get that from social media, but they don't get the same basketball IQ, right? They don't, so that's what I try to work on with him, right? Head up, what's gonna happen next, right? Anticipate where things are going. Um, and you don't see that a lot with AAU. And then parents get into it too. It's like, mm. get my guy some minutes, right? Or my girl some minutes, and that makes it more difficult. It's not like that in the, Euro- the European parents aren't aren't hummingbird the helicopter and they're not hovering over. Not, not like here. <laughs> not like here because, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on kids too, right? They're in the meal ticket and that's tough. That is yeah. really tough. Dennis Schroeder caught some flag. He said, they asked Dennis Schroeder, he says, because European basketball is straight basketball IQ, no entertainment. Straight coaching, really, really high IQ guys who know how to play the game. Of course, the U.S. is the best league in the world, but Europeans, they're coming for sure. Yep. KD didn't take kindly to that. He's like, because he took a picture of them when, they, when they won the gold medal, <laughs> you know, best IQ right. and entertainment. What was Dennis Schroeder trying to say, and do you understand what he was saying? Yeah, of course I understand, right? So it, once you get past the, the top 30 players, right, IQ matters, right? Because you've got to be able to play with Luka. You've got to be able to play with Kyrie because they have like mm-hmm. high IQs and everything else to go with it. Right. But the guys who are you know, fifth, sixth, seventh, and lower on the roster, you got to have a high basketball IQ to know where your fit, know where your role is. And if all you ever learned was, you know, dribble, if you don't have an IQ, right, it's going to be harder to fit in the NBA, right? And so 
they're both, you know, Katie give him a shit was right because we have the best players. It's not even close, right? right? But at the but still out of those top 20 players in the, you know, there's a reason why those guys have been MVP. Mm-hmm. And so if you have the level of skill that you need and you have that basketball IQ and it's developed. And if you flip it around, if we did the same development here for kids and you combine the athleticism and the skill with the basketball IQ, there might be a half the number of European players or foreign players in the NBA. We just don't give them that basketball IQ support. Are we, are American players, are we too reliant on athleticism? I think it depends. To a certain extent, yes. Um, There are some players that, like the KDs of the world, like the LeBrons of the world, that are American have basketball cues off the charts. You know, they're just insane, you know, every element of the game. Um, But kids see that and they try to replicate, you know, what Anthony Edwards does. Yeah. Right? You know, Duncan me, I said, (laughs) right? And, you know, Duncan Demix and all that stuff, right? And I don't see that from European kids coming in. Um, and I think that's the difference. If you applied the same training techniques and combine that with the athleticism that we have in this country, wow! Well, yeah, it'd, it'd be a whole different league. I've never seen him play in person, but you've had a front row seat to see this guy over the last decade, and that's Nikola Jokic. Yeah. When you look at a guy, and you, I mean, just look at him from television, you're like, okay, he doesn't have the cap shoulders like Giannis. He's not freight trained like LeBron. He doesn't have the, he can't jump out the gym like a young Shaq. But bro, he just light people up. What is it about him, Mark, that makes him so great, so unique that he's able to dominate when he doesn't have anything about him that's physically dominant? Yeah, I mean, if you just saw him in a play cup, like, you would be like, who, you know, who's the chubby, chubby dude, right? <laughs> oh, my God, he can play, right? But it's skill. Right. Skill and basketball IQ. You combine being 6'11", 6'10", 11, with basketball IQ, skill. He can shoot. He can dribble. He can pass. He th- sees things three steps ahead. You know, him and Luca are like, you know, twins in a lot of respects. Um, and when you have all those elements to your game, like there's always a place for a shooter, right? Yes. Always a place for a shooter in the NBA. There's always a place for somebody who can rebound. Now, if you can rebound and shoot, Okay, you're going to be good. If you can rebound, shoot, handle, you're going to be really, really you good. Went 50 million. Yeah, if you can <laughs> rebound, shoot, handle, and your basketball IQ is top five in the NBA, you're unstoppable. Right. In 2006, you said the situation with Dirk, it changed. He started to take the way he ate, the way he trained, the way he did. Every single thing was different than the previous years because he had gotten so close. He got a taste of what it was like to play in the NBA finals. You go up 2 0. You feeling you feel, you had to be feeling. I thought free. this was gonna be a fun interview. <laughs> <laughs> it is. We go we go get to the fun stuff. So when you go up 2-0, you just like we got this. No, we, we were up 2-0, and it was the third quarter, and we're in Miami, and I always sit right behind the bench yes. to this day, right? And I'm standing up clapping, and I'm thinking we're up like 14 in the yes, third quarter. and I'm thinking to myself, oh shit, we might sweep these dudes. Not. <laughs> Two seconds later, right, Udonis Haslam steals the ball, goes in for layup. Now it's 12. Then a couple minutes later, Shaq pushes Eric Dampier, pushes him, and they call a foul on Eric Dampier. I'm like, oh, if he hits these free throws, we're in trouble. Shaq hits two free throws, (laughs) right? I'm like, oh, shit, we're fucked. And... You know, went downhill from there. You know, and Dwayne Wade goes to the free he throw line crazy. 973 times, right? True, true. <laughs> so it was over. Mark, let me ask you, the, the relationship that you have is unlike maybe only what Dr. Buzz had with Magic. Is that you party, you hang out with the players, you hung out with the players. Do you find, how do you, how do you manage that? Because at the end of the day, you are the owner. You yeah. do, I mean, you have the, you can sign players, you can trade players, you can release players. How is that, how does that, has that ever interfered with your relationship with a player? Yeah, for sure. Like my first year, we had a player named Eric Strickland, who I got to be really close with. Mm -hmm. Went to Nebraska, um, didn't have a long NBA career, but great dude, right? And we got to be really good friends and it was draft night and our guys were like, you know, here's a trade we need to do. And I'm like, oh, fuck, right? We're going to have to trade them. And, you know, and it was then I learned that, 
you've got to do what's best for the team and players will respect that, right? right? And players, you know, when they get traded, they may not like it, but they see another opportunity, hopefully the next place. But I also realize that basketball is X number of years. Life's a long, long time, Correct. right? And like, even when we screwed up and let Steve Nash go, I've gotten to be friends with Nash. He took, a time, took some time, right? Mm-hmm. He, you know, he didn't like me for a long time, right. but you know, now we're, we're friends again. And so, you know, you just, it's okay to be friends with them. It's okay um, to get close to them. You just have to be honest with them. Right. And if you're honest with them, it's okay. What are, you, what are your thoughts on super teams? They don't is, really it, is it work. over? Yeah, they don't really work. And it's going to be a lot harder now with the new CBA. You know, um, with the new collective bargaining agreement, you know, they have this first apron and second apron thing, right? And if you have three max out players, you're right there by the time you have 15 guys, you're over the second apron. And if you stay at the second apron for, you know, two years, you know, you're getting your first draft pick moved to the end of the draft or you're getting... You can't trade it, and then the second time, second year, if you're over, you you move to the end of the draft, right, no matter what. And there's limits on the trades you can make. It's hard to build a team. And so I think it's going to be harder and harder and harder for teams to have, you know, a big three that are all maxed out. Now, what you want is, like, what we hope is, like, a, a player, well, Clay comes in, right, and Najee Marshall comes in, but we got someone we drafted, like Derek Lively, right. who can be an all-star caliber player or better. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like um, the Celtics. They were able to make a lot of trades because the um, Jay Brown and um, Tatum, yeah, were on not rookie contracts, but on lower contracts Mm -hmm. as the cap went up. That's what you need to have happen. And if you go for it and you get three max out players and it doesn't work, I mean, look at the Clippers. You know, they had three amazing max out players and, you know, injuries got in the way. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be really hard to to keep together a team like that. Yeah, it's going to be hard for the Clippers to, to keep that thing because PG is gone. Gone. Kawhi can, can, for whatever reason, he can't stay healthy. So it's tough. It's tough, right? And I don't want to talk specifically about any one yeah. team, but, you know, three max out players, particularly those numbers go up. Yes. Right? Those numbers go up because the max out contracts, you know, as a percentage, you're at 35% for a super max of the cap. And if you got three of them, right? That's 105% of the cap, yes. right? Depending on when you <laughs> sign it, right? Yeah. So it's not going to stay that way because, the, you know, you'll sign a guy at 35%, then the cap will go up 10%, right? right? So he won't stay at 35%. But it's close enough, right, over just three guys that it's going to be hard to keep them together. LeBron, obviously, are you surprised that he's been able to play as well as he has for as long as he has to be as durable as he's been? Yeah, of course. I thought he was done five times already. <laughs> The guy's a beast, but he's got that mental fortitude, right? It's like we talked about with Dirk. He's just one of those guys that he understands the assignment. You got to take care of your body. You yeah. got to take care of your mind. You've got to take care of your skills. His three point shooting has improved. Like, yes. you know, and so he gets credit for doing the work. And, you know, that's what makes him one of the greatest of all time. TD, Teddy, taking it to the house. Reservations for six. Whatever you call a touchdown, one thing's for sure. Touchdowns matter more at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. On the ground, in the air, from the special teams or the defense, we don't care how you score them. We want to bet on touchdowns. And at DraftKings Sportsbook is the number one place to bet touchdowns. Ready to place your first NFL bet? Try something as simple as betting on a player to score a touchdown. Go to DraftKings Sportsbook app and make your bet today. Ready to do your touchdown dance of your own? New DraftKings customers can bet five bucks and get 250 instantly in bonus bets and get one month free of NFL Plus Premium. Download the DraftKings Sports app. Use code Shannon. That's code Shannon for new customers to get 250 in bonus bets when you bet just five bucks and get one month free of NFL Plus Premium. Only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. I tell kids and I tell when I talk to athletes, I say you have to spend more time because you're going to spend more time off the court or off the field than you do on the field. They say for a lawyer, for every hour that you spend in the courtroom, you need to spend two, two and a half hours. Same in business. Yeah, same in business. 
So if you're going to spend on the court, you spend that kind of time, you need to spend time eating and taking care of your body. Especially as you get older, training. right? Yes. It does not get easier. Yes, it you know? does not get easier. Trust harder. me, you're still young. Wait till it gets harder and harder and harder. <laughs> you know, that shit is no fun. But he gets all the credit in the world for having that discipline to be able to do it. Most guys don't. He wants to be an owner. Um, obviously, you know, I think you guys are looking at maybe bringing a team um, to Vegas. Uh, I think Seattle is being talked about. I don't know if there's anybody else, but I think um, that's th those are the two franchises. And obviously, he's kind of looking at the the one in in in, in Vegas. Uh -huh. What type of owner you think LeBron would make? I don't know. Players, it's going to be a lot harder for a player, right? We saw Michael Jordan, right? Um, great guy, had some success, but not as much as he wanted, mm -hmm. right? It, it's hard because players have one mindset and they look at other players in a certain way, you know. Man, why you can't do that? I could do that. I could do. Let me show you, right? I'm Michael Jordan. I'm 55 years old. I'm gonna whoop your ass, right? Um, but yeah, it's it's just a completely different perspective. That's hard to disconnect yourself from, and it's hard to be objective and not have your player mindset. And so, like when you've seen general managers that are former players, they're not the great players that were, you know, that are good general managers. It's the role players that got to watch everybody else and understand how to fit these pieces together. Right. Um, and so for any superstar, it's going to be hard. Being an owner, what's a typical day for a Mark Cuban when you when you were the full-time owner of the Mavericks, what's a typical day? What time do you wake up and what's your schedule? So it depends what part of the season it is. Okay. So during the off season is when I spend, had to do most of the work, right? Because the free agency and the draft and everything. So that's where I had to pay the most attention. And then when you get to um, the trade deadline, that's another time when you have to pay a lot of attention. Otherwise, I'm just screaming and yelling, right? <laughs> there, there's, you know... As long as there's, you know, and it also depends if you're winning or losing. If if you're winning, it's easy. Mm -hmm. Everything just goes. If you're losing um, and you don't want to lose because there's, there's rebuilding mm -hmm. and then there's losing when you think you're going to win. And when you're losing when you think you're going to win, that's when an owner has to do its stuff, right? Because you've got to communicate. You've got to make decisions. What about, you know, is it the coach? Is it the players? Is it the general manager? And is it the decisions we made? Is it chemistry? Why are we not performing the way we expected um, this team to perform? That's when it's hard as an owner because you got to figure it out. I mean, <laughs> I remember, like, it was 2008, maybe. We were playing in Sacramento, and, um, no, it, it was later than that. But in any event, we were playing in Sacramento, and we just were not playing hard. And I remember walking to, I've only given probably four locker room speeches, right? And I walked into the locker room, and I started pointing at different guys. Yo, did you get your paycheck this week? Yeah. Did you get your paycheck this week? And I went around to all of them. You get your paycheck this week? And they all said, yes. Then motherfucking play like you got your paycheck, wow. right? Because you aren't doing shit, right? <laughs> and so, so, so I can imagine the looks like. And we lost that game. <laughs> <laughs> do, do owners ever, because I, I heard you say you're like, is it the coach? Is it the players? Is it the GM? Is it anything else in the staff? Do owners ever look at themselves like, is it me? Yeah, of course. Oh, all the time. Right. Because it's my final responsibility, like we said before. And you, you're going to make mistakes. And I've made plenty. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I traded early on. I traded for this one dude. And literally, I thought he was the Unabomber. Um, I thought he was going to blow shit up, like for real blow shit up. And I'm like, what the hell did I do? You know, and at the beginning, it was just like, okay, let's see if we can integrate him, integrate him. It just wasn't going to work out. So he was just on the Stairmaster all day, every day, and that was it. And Because we couldn't trade him. He wasn't tradable. Um, but so you make mistakes like that. Um, and you just got to own it. Right. You know? Um, in the early days when I first bought, you could kind of buy your way out of mistakes and buy your way into a better team because there are a lot more old school owners. Now there's, you know, either super, super rich people or private equity groups mm -hmm. and they can afford to play the whole game. Back in the early days and, you know, the 2000s, there were a lot of old school owners. Mom that and pops. Yeah, the mom and pops that have been there 40 years, right? And, you know, you could buy a draft pick for $3 million and I'd be like, Okay, you know, make a trade and take on $25 million in salary to save their ass. Right. Okay, but you can't even do that in the CBA anymore. And now they have a lot more money, so they don't, they're, they don't like, they're like, okay, I'll buy that pick. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs>
Mark, you made a decision that you sold a majority share of the Mavericks. And I know with the Mavericks, of all the companies, I think the Mavericks are your baby. I yeah. think they, they've they meant the most in, um, to you. Yeah, that's um, the only one I've ever been for 24 years. Right. right. How difficult, how do how did you come to that decision? And was that a difficult decision? Because I'm sure you thought long and hard, like, I'm going to do it. No, I'm not. I'm going to do yeah. it. No, I'm not. I mean, it had more to do. Well, there was two reasons, only two reasons, right? One, because of my family, okay. right? You know, I'm at that age now. I'm not going to be around for 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. And so are my kids, you know, my kids now are 15, 18, and 21. Are they going to want to run this? And what if they decide not to? And then what do I do, right? And and so that was the biggest thing. And and you know what sports are like, too, was also I don't want to just automatically put pressure on them. Mm -hmm. It's great when you're winning, right? Everybody wants to run a team when you're winning. Correct. But when the shit's hitting the fan and you suck <laughs> and you know what social media is like and kids are on social media all the time, I don't want, didn't want to put my kids in the position where they're like, you, you know, and they have to deal with that stuff while they're just developing as adults. So that was one. And number two, um, to compete in the NBA now is expensive. Um, not all teams make money. It's not like the NFL. And in order to have the money to be able to do whatever you need, luxury tax, whatever it may be, it's not just about technology or tickets or TV anymore. Like technology, okay, I got that down, right? TV, media, I got that shit down too. Streaming, got that shit down. But now you got to build real estate. I don't know shit about real estate wow. and never was and never did. And so when I had a chance to work with Patrick Dumont, um, starting years ago, um, we would talk all the time about bringing, you know, um, resort-based casino gaming to, to Dallas or to Texas. And, you know, he would talk about what it takes to build a casino and to build a new arena that fit in there. And I'm like, I don't know anything about this. And so if the Mavs were going to compete, I was going to have to learn all that stuff. And honestly, I don't want to learn it. And if that was, if it was going to take $2 billion in cash to make all that work, Steve Ballmer's got that. I don't have that two billion dollars, right? <laughs> um, I do now, which I'm happy about. But, <laughs> <laughs> but now you don't want to be. Now you don't want to be. Well, that. no, I just didn't know, right? right? It'd be one thing I could have borrowed it yeah. and all that stuff, but I would have had to learn it, or I would have had to just trust somebody, and that's just not my style. That's a lot of money to trust. That's a lot of money to trust, and a lot on the line. And so now I've got a great partner who will you know going to improve the arena we have today. We'll build something new. We'll be able to make a destination that Dallas will be proud of. And he knows things. He's forgotten more about building than I've ever known. And so it makes a great partner, which puts the Mavs in a much better position to compete. Right. What are your thoughts on gambling? Do you think you're going to be able to do have gambling here in Texas? I do. I don't know when, but I do. Because, I mean, you guys live outside of Texas. Yes. Um, what is it that you save up and get excited to come to Texas on a vacation to do? You ever thought about coming to Texas on a vacation? No. You know anybody who does? I guess college kids go to what South Padre or something. Is that yeah for spring break? <laughs> yeah for spring. That's, that's you know it. maybe you go to Austin to Sixth Street or you know Austin City Limits. South by Southwest. I yeah, guess. you know, but it's not really like a vacation. You yeah, don't think of it true. as a vacation destination anywhere in Texas. Mm -hmm. And so let me change that question. If we put a Bellagio or a Venetian in downtown Dallas, yeah, they come. People want to gamble. Yeah, and not just gamble, right? You like you go spa, to Vegas now. You spa, you, yeah, you got, got you know, you have Celine shows, Dion, you got, right? You have the yeah. shows, right? You got all that stuff, and you become a, a, you know, being in the center of the country. If you put a Venetian right in the middle of Dallas, we're going to all of a sudden become a top three tourist destination in this country, and so that's why I think it'll pass. I read a report, and let me let you think about this: is that Americans are spending more on sports betting than they are in investing. Are you surprised by that? I think it depends on the age of the person, because I read something similar, right? And so if you're real young, mm -hmm. you're you're betting, but you're not betting a lot, right? Uh, or you're buying crypto, Dogecoin to the moon, baby. Uh, <laughs> you know, but you, you know, it's hard, it's hard for kids to save money, right? Mm -hmm. And so you know how kids are, right? You, you know, you're a 22 year old dude or woman for that matter in college, right? And I know sports, I know sports, you know. And so you play it and and you're probably gonna lose, but it's fun, right? It's it's just entertainment money, um, kind of like crypto is. But yeah, I, I just think if when you get to people who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, I don't think, you know, the numbers I've seen are that they're not, unless you have a real problem, they're not overspending. Right. When you sold the company, Mark, you gave your employees, uh, it was reported $35 million, you gave them bonuses. Why did you feel the need to do that? You know, and it ended up being a lot more, actually, but I'm not there without them. 
And I did it, my first two companies, I did it with Micro Solutions. You know, we had 80 employees. They all got paid. I did it with um, Broadcast.com out of 330 employees. 300 became millionaires. And I wanted to do the same thing with um, the Mavs. You know, they they were there for me the whole time. And, you know, it was enough money that for those who were there, you know, 20 years or more, it was life-changing money. You should think? Yeah. <laughs> so when you started the first streaming platform, you are like, okay, I can foreshadow i can think this is heading in this direction you say you and your partner you bought a computer you and your partner you guys sit down and you start coding how long before you before it started becoming profitable because that's the, that's the hard it's, i mean yeah. it's, if, if it's it profitable took, right away it like, took us four years to get to break even okay so we had gone public it was the number one ipo in the history of the stock market in 1998 and we sold it in um, June of 2020, I think it was. And that second quarter, we were right around cash flow break, break even. But we were only in business for four years. And so, you mean 2000? Or 2000, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so we were only in business for four years. So that wasn't horrible for a tech business like right. that. Did you ever, I mean, YouTube, Netflix, I remember this had to be 1999, 2000. I went to a nail, I went to a nail shop. And the lady was telling me about how she get movies from Netflix. I said, so tell me about it. She said, what you do is that, you know, you tell them what you want and they'll send it, the, the DVD, right, yeah, yeah. right to your door. You watch them when you want to and you put them back in the thing and send them back. I was like, I said, well, what about Blockbuster? She's like, nah, I think Blockbuster is going to go away. I was like, I don't know about that. She was right. <laughs> she was right. I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, had I just taken like $10,000, $15,000. And put it, it in the Netflix, boom. <laughs> No kidding. Did you know that it would blow that there would be a net because you were new YouTube and Netflix yeah, before they were even yeah for of. sure. I, I mean that's why I was so upset with Yahoo. Like they had a huge opportunity. I mean they were YouTube before YouTube when they bought us, and you know when the internet stock bubble burst, their board of directors just say pull everything back right. instead of sticking with it. And you know Reed Hastings and the folks at Netflix. They were like not pulling back, right? They they were going for it. And then YouTube shows up and they couldn't even afford to stay in business. But then um, Google buys them and that just changed everything. Yeah. Because because at first YouTube was a streaming platform. Now they're more like ads. I mean. Yeah. I mean, it was like 2006 they started and it was just like little short videos and stupid right. videos and stuff. But, you know, credit to them. They they got Google to partner and Google did it right. So, so when a company comes in and they says, okay, we're going to buy you, is that all cash? Is that cash plus stocks? In our case, it depends on the company, right? But in our case with broadcast.com, it was all stock. And so um, in my mind, I was like, oh, shit, right? What if this all the stock market crashed? <laughs> so I, I went once I was legally able to, I did something called a caller. So I sold the right to somebody to buy the stock at a higher price that's selling calls. Mm -hmm. And then I used that money to buy puts, which protected me in case the stock price cratered. Well, the stock price did crater and those puts became worth even more money than I would gotten from the stock. And they called it one of the top 10 trades in Wall Street history. So that's how they call it. The yeah. So what was that that number one e-commerce purchase? What did you purchase? I bought, bought a jet online. G, it had to be a Gulf Stream. Yeah, G, G5. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I just got paid, and <laughs> I was like, time is like my number one thing. I want a jet, right? right? I want a jet. And so I'm like, well, I'm, I'm an internet guy. I'm going to practice what I preach. So I got a contact at Gulf Stream. I emailed them, and I said, okay, can I get a, a test flight? They set up a test flight. I'm like, okay, I like this. <laughs> Hard to you know, figure out I liked it, right? right. What's the price? told me the price was $40 million. I texted him, I'm like, deal, right? Send me the paperwork, email me the paperwork. Right. Emailed it to me, I did a wire transfer, did the whole thing online. Did, so the jet was already, cause you can build your own jet, but you didn't no, have No, you that. can't build your you, own jet. You can't jet. build your own? No, hell no, would you want, hey, hey, Shannon, come on to my jet that I built. Would you no, get no, on no, that no, jet? No, 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 I'm saying like, you can <laughs> Oh no, the features and everything. Yeah, the yeah, features yeah, 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 no, yeah. Not build, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I ain't horrible wheel for right. I don't know nothing about flying. No, right? Um, yeah, so I, that's what I did. So I asked for, you know, where's the where's the kitchen in it? How many seats? What's the layout and all that? And the test flight that they gave me matched that. Okay. Tell us about, was it American Airlines? You bought the lifetime two, pass. The lifetime pass. And you bought two lifetime passes where you could fly first class anywhere, anywhere yeah. in the world yeah. whenever you wanted. Right. So it's just one. It was a little card I got, right? Yeah. But I could take anybody with me. Okay. Right. And so this is after I sold my first company, Micro Solutions. I was 29, I think, 30. And um, 
you know, just sold this company, walked away with a few million dollars. And I was like, my buddies and I going out just got destroyed. We went to all one of these old school steakhouses. They don't really have any more, but um, where you could ask for a phone and plug it into a jack in the wall there right at your table. Yes. And I'm like, you know what? They're like, what do you want? Well, you know, what do you think you're going to do with all this money? And I'm like, I don't care about cars or houses, but boy, you know, I fly a lot for work. If I could get this lifetime pass, I wonder if such a thing exists. So I'm like, like I even, because I had memorized, because I traveled, like 1-800-433-6464, the American, I think that's still the number, right? <laughs> Is it? Does that sound right? But anyways. Um, we'll confirm. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, so I called them up, just slurring my words. Do you guys sell lifetime passes? And they're like, let me connect you to the air pass department. I'm like, what? <laughs> Bam, right? And so I got all that information, hung over as hell, and um, I've signed up. And it was Initially, it was $125,000, and then I upgraded it, I think. I forget how much I paid, but it gave me almost unlimited miles for me and somebody else for the rest of my life. Wow. Yeah. So where, where's the pass at now? I gave I, my, my dad's passed away. I gave it to him, and then I gave it to a friend as a gift. So you, it was transferable? Just one time. Just one time. Yeah. Okay. And But because my dad died, they let me do it because he didn't use it a lot, right. and I didn't use it a lot. So um they let me transfer it. I don't think they do that anymore. No, they don't. Yeah, they don't. They don't. <laughs> Can you put somebody in the, in the way people But what a deal, right? I mean, let me just tell you, like $125,000, and I'm thinking, okay, doing the math, that's 12 cents a mile. I can deal with that, right? And, like, I'd be out in L.A. or wherever, Dallas. I'm like, you want a road trip? Let's let's call American Airlines and see if they got any flights tonight. Let's go to Vegas. <laughs> What's your name again? Doesn't matter. Let's go to Vegas. <laughs> Boy, you lived a life. You, you <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> you that was what the early '90s, man. That was a different time. What type of investor is Mark Cuban? Now, just really conservative. You know, I I like investing in um, small companies, startups, where I can help entrepreneurs because I like to do that. That's what I do on Shark Tank. Um, but with interest rates at five plus percent, why take risk? Right. Right. So it's easier to do that. Um, either through tax freeze or treasuries or whatever. Um, but I still like to invest in startups. Right. Man, you on Shark Tank, y'all be taking them people. Man, man how y'all going to take half the company? They don't work like five, ten years trying to build this up, and y'all come in and taking 27%. They offered you five. Can you go to 10? Why you taking 30? <laughs> Damn. Well, it depends on the size of the company, right? Because <laughs> I'm giving them a lot of money because if they didn't need the money, they wouldn't be they there. They wouldn't be there. You're right? absolutely correct. And so they're not there because, you know, Maybe they're there because of the commercial, but um, they're there because they need help. Right. And so, you know, it's been a lot of fun. I've invested in hundreds of companies there over the 15 years. Some have done really well. Beatbox Beverages, you may have heard of. Dude Wipes, you probably have heard uh, heard of. There's just a bunch of them that are just destroyed, just killed it. Um, and some of them didn't do as good, right? And so you've got you've to understand that, you know, 25% are going to go belly up right. um, for whatever reason. Forty-five. Now let's say sixty percent are going to be okay, right? And fifteen percent are going to kill it. And I got to make sure those fifteen percent I really get paid on right. to cover all the other ones. Didn't the Ring? Didn't didn't Ring, ring came, come, on, came, came but, on? But I didn't like that deal anyways, right? Because Ring had to. They sold for a billion dollars, but they had to raise like five hundred million to get there. You know, it, obviously it was a good product and it paid out. But my, I have a rule, right? If you have to raise hundreds of millions of dollars to do tens of millions in sales, it ain't going to work for me, right. right? Now, if you're able to sell and get an exit, more power to you, and, and he was able to, so he deserves all the credit. Have you gotten upset when a shark stole one of your deals? No one steals my shit. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't watched the show they enough. Come they come on there and say, Mark, I want to use Yeah, for sure, right? You haven't watched the show. You think anybody got one of mine? No, hell no. <laughs> But I'm, I'm um, other than the uh, the Mavericks, obviously that was a big investment. But you own stuff. You own Netflix, Amazon. I did for a while. Yeah, when they were turning around, right? When people didn't understand um, what they were doing, I, I made a lot of money. Um, I bought calls, which you know the right to buy the share at a higher price, and I bought a lot of them, mm -hmm. a lot of them, and they went up ten times what I put up. So I was a happy camper. So, but when they say it takes money to make money, because you've been in the situation, because you've 
created these companies and been able to have money. So when these lesser, when these, like you said, you like to invest in startups, you're able to make a killing. Yeah, I mean, look, in order to be a billionaire, you have to be lucky as fuck. There's no way around it, okay. right? I don't care how smart I think I am or Bill Gates or Steve Ballmer Buffett, or Buffett or Elon Musk. It takes luck, right? You know, you've got to, if I started um, doing things five years earlier, right, and coming out of college and the internet wasn't happening. Yeah, you know. Right? You know, it's just when we started... Um, Cosplay, when we started um, Broadcast.com, that was right at the right time. And no one had done streaming. And the and the internet stock market was just blowing up, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's how you become a billionaire. And that, you know, I worked my ass off. I was smart. I did shit other people were afraid to do. But if the internet stock market hasn't, hadn't been the same, I'd be just some guy, you know, just chilling, you know, <laughs> with a nice house. And you'd have no idea who I was. Right. But, it ha it, but you have to take some risk. Because I remember when um, Google came out and they thought the the, pay, the the shares were gonna open up at about $85 a share. And I remember sitting to my financial guys and I was like, oh, you know what? I had just signed with the Ravens, so I had some some, some money. money. And I was like, man, I'd like to buy, you know, $300,000 worth. Well, it opens up at 115 and he says it's overpriced. And so, you know, it's gonna come back. Right, they don't have the profit, yeah. Hey, I've done that, I know. You're not the first one to say, it's like yeah. NVIDIA. Oh. It's like NVIDIA right now, right? I, like I told my son, my son wanted to invest in it and he bought some and I'm like, you know, I'd rather see it come down first. And my son's like, ah, I got you. <laughs> Who's the expert now, I right? Mean, think about it. And how many times has Google split? Oh, I mean, you know, it's worth over $3 trillion. Yes. Now. $3 trillion. Oh. Trillions, trillions. I mean, not billions. That's a thousand billions of trillion dollars. Yes. So that my investment, I'd have, I'd, have, I'd have been a billionaire with you. Right? <laughs> you fucked up. <laughs> I, 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 did, I, I did. I fucked up bad. Because Netflix and Google, and I had the money to do it. But you I know? let somebody talk me out of it. But and it, but he. But then like, there's 25 other ones that right that you thought you should go in and he talked you out, out of it. They, they lost their butt. And say, so it evens out. Yeah. When people, when you're so benevolent, when people try to take advantage of you, I, I read that you had an employee that steal from you. Uh -huh. When you've been as generous as you have over your the course of your career, how does that, does that make you sour on people? No, no, because people steal. What am I going to do? Right? Yeah, steal from somebody else. Don't steal from me. Rogue Look, you know folk. what? It's a good problem to have, right? <laughs> that means you got it, huh? I can afford it. Right. Like my first company, Micro Solutions, though, there was a lady, Renee Hardy, R-E-N-E-E-H-A-R-D-Y, right? We, she was our receptionist okay. and her job, she had one job, one right? Job. Take their payables for our vendors, put it in an envelope, lick the envelope, take it to the post office, yeah. right? We had $84,000 in the bank. I'll never forget. Get a call from the bank. Sir, this woman just came through the drive through and the checks, where whited out, the payee was whited out. Remember white out? Was, yes, yes, yes. She wrote her name in it. And I'm what? like, I'm like, you didn't cash them, did you? Of course we did. We're a bank, sir. She took 82 of the $84,000 that we had. We were flat broke and the 82,000 was supposed to go to vendors. Right. So now we had to call the vendors, say, please work with us. We'll bust our ass. We'll make sure you get paid. And they did. They worked with us, right? And the rest is history. But she could have just boom, done. Then I was mad. That's why I always say Renee Hardy. <laughs> did you, did you pr press charges? We couldn't find her. That's been years and no one's found her since. And now I get emails from people, right? That are like, I heard about this name, Renee Hardy, you know, and so-and-so's name. It's just random names, right? right? The same name. And like, no, no one's ever found her. She's probably changed her name or whatever. Mark, when you accumulate the, the amount of wealth that you have, how has your inner circle changed? It hasn't. It hasn't at all. Like my guys from you know, grade school, high school that I grew up with. We just did a Zoom. We do every two weeks. They come out to Mavs games. I go get see them. Wow. They're still my buddies, my um, college buddies, mm -hmm. you know, Ben and Tim, you know, are still my best friends. I played rugby in college and after my rugby teammates are still my best buddies. Um, when I came to Dallas, I slept, you know, five guys, six guys in a three bedroom apartment and, you know, Shippy and Suze and Ron Ead and, you know, Fred Turner and all these guys, they're all still my, my great friends. 
at the end of the day, at heart, you a college frat guy. Oh, for sure, right? <laughs> you know, it's, you got it's, six guys, and we in the bedroom. We just hanging out. We go out drag beer. You matter, right? You know, live like like. I bought a book when I was in college. It was called um, "How to Retire by the Age of 35. Okay. And basically, what it says is live like a student, so you can save all your money. Right. And then if you do that, you know, and you you know, even if you're investing in like just treasuries, or whatever, that pay three, four, five percent. Okay, you know, you get you know, a million dollars and you make 5% on that, that's 50 grand. If you're living like a student, you turn that into 2 million, et cetera, et cetera. And that was my goal, right? And so moving down to Dallas and living, you know, sleeping on the floor the whole time, you know, going out and and literally buying one beer and eating all the fried mushrooms and shit. I was cool with that. I was having a blast. It was no problem at all. What was your fact? Because I think the thing is, is it's easier said than done because a lot of times, I'm just speak to me. I don't want to speak to anybody else. But to speak to me, we didn't have anything growing up. And I've always wanted to make sure that I could take care of my family. But I wanted some things that I couldn't get when I was growing yeah, up. For sure. I wanted to be able to go to a restaurant if I wanted something nice, be able to go. If I saw something, you know, clothes as far as clothes, maybe a watch, I want to be able to get it. Um, your mom and dad, were you like middle class? Yeah, middle my dad did upholstery in cars, so, um, or see, so if you, if this had a rip in it, mm -hmm. you take it to where my dad worked and he'd sew it up, right? My mom did odd jobs, you know, my dad never made more than $40,000 a year in his life. That was good money, though. You do realize what you're No, I know. I'm not complaining. Kid. Yeah, I'm not complaining, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not complaining, right? But still, you know, and that's, you know, he wouldn't retire. Right. Like, even after I started making money, he wouldn't retire. Really? No, no. He, he had to work, right? He That's, you know. That's his thing. He's that's his thing. Yeah. And, like, he had to be able to pull out that credit card if we all went to dinner and pay for it. Because if I paid for it, that was an insult. Wow. I read you had your hips replaced. Yeah, both of them. I had both of mine replaced. It's a lot better, isn't it? Boy, it's a new lease on life. <sighs> I'm telling you, you wake up and it's just like, oh. I mean, that I'm living. Because back, I was surviving. It, that, the pain, it, there's like uh, uh, on a scale of one to ten, what's the pain? Ten? What no, do you think no, I'm in here for? Right? <laughs> because you're like, you, you'd be in bed, right? You'd be trying to sleep and they would lock up. And you'd have to do like a push-up and like drop. I would have to do a drop just to get them to unlock so yeah. I can walk. Yeah. And like, I remember... um I was, I got one done at 49 and then the other one done like five years later. And I remember walking through the, um, the hall of the arena and one of our guys was like, dude, you walk like an 80 year old man. And I'm like, okay, it's time. It's time. You yeah. know, my, my legs wouldn't go that wide. It was just like, it's, it, I mean, how you have to get out of bed, you got to roll. And yeah. Get up out of yeah, bed and everything. yeah. It, it was, it's, but I mean, and the, doc, the doctor told me, he said, you're going to have a new lease on life. I'm like, yeah, they, you, everybody, every doctor says that after surgery, but boy, who changed everything. It, it absolutely changed everything. I mean, this new company, tell us about the new drug company, uh, Cost Plus Drugs is helping me. Hold on. Y'all help me and buy Viagra and Cialis for a cheaper price. Are you buying from us? Nah, I do that roast. I'm on Romans. Them roll sparks? No, fuck that, right? No, nah, hell no, nah, don't fuck that. Nah, nah, let me nah, just, nah, nah, let nah, me nah. just tell you, let me just tell you. You can buy 90 generic Cialis or generic Viagra for less than you pay for a bag of M&Ms from costplusdrugs.com. Wow. But the ones I got, they, they knock fire sparks. That's the name, sparks. Got that red spark on it, red pill. Take the red pill. Let me just tell you, right? If you get like the 20 milligrams... <laughs> You won't let anybody walk with it. Never mind. <laughs> but you go to costplusdrugs.com. And so um, I actually got a cold email from a doctor named Dr. Alex Oshmyansky, and her office is right across the street there. And he goes, I want to start this pharmacy that manufactures, compounding pharmacy that manufactures drugs mm -hmm. that are on a shortage list, right? Yeah. So that people can't get them. I want to make them so they can get access to their medications. And I'm like, that's great, but what more can we do? And so we started talking, and this is right about the time the farmer bro was going to jail. And I'm like, if this dude can like buy one drug, Daraprim, and just jack up the price, then there's something wrong with this business. Let me right. let me look into it. And it was really obvious really quickly that what was missing is transparency. Nobody trusts the price of healthcare. No one trusts healthcare uh, at all, right? Yeah. Particularly medica medications, right? So if you get a prescription for something, the first question they ask isn't, you know, can you afford it? It's like, where's your pharmacy? Right. And then, you know, we've all heard stories of people waiting in line, don't know what it's going to cost and can't afford it, right. losing insurance, whatever. So we started um, this company called costplusdrugs.com, costplusdrugs.com. Mm -hmm. And so when you go to costplusdrugs.com and not that you need it, but like if you put in Cialis with um, Tadilafil, which is generic Cialis mm -hmm. and you need 90 of them, we'll show you our cost. 
right? Whatever we pay for it, we mark it up 15%. We add our shipping and handling on it. And then when you add it all together, in this case, less than a bag of M&Ms, right. but it's going to be cheaper than anywhere else. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and so what else is cool about it, though, is there are a lot. There were a lot of companies before us that um, these things called pharmacy benefit managers, we don't need to get into it, that just jack up the price of certain drugs because they're they're not used supply all that much. Demand. Yeah, supply and demand. And so, like, I had a friend who was in this car wreck, and he lost his insurance, and they were going to... Um, there was this drug called Dropadoza, Dropadoza, and they were like saying they were going to charge him thirty thousand dollars every three months, and he's like, I can't afford that. Can you? Hell do no, not very many people can, can afford that. I'm like, let me check. So I check into it, and this was two years ago, and I'm like, okay, Landon, I can get it to you for sixty four dollars a month. There's these other drugs for muscular dis um, um, multiple sclerosis, rather, and we're seeing our price be $21, $22. Other people are charging $2,000. Other drugs, you know, um, imatinib, which is for chemotherapy, anywhere from $200 to $2,000, depending on the strength, our price is like $23 to $24. And so when someone comes to the site, you know, you've got this disease and we're the only way you can afford your medication. Not only are you buying from us, but you're telling everybody, you're telling your doctor. And so we, you know, we launched January 19th of 2022. So here we are two and a half years later, millions of customers just changing people's lives. I get emails and texts and social media almost every day saying, oh my God, you saved my life. So if right now we're almost, we have like 2,500 generics, 74 different brands, and we're adding more and more brands. But if you want to see if you can reduce the price of your medications, go to costplusdrugs.com. What made you decide to do that? The healthcare industry is fucked up. I mean, what could be, you know, I've You're done a lot of people off, huh? Yeah, I mean, what could be a better legacy? What could be a better way, you know, to really be successful in business than fucking up the healthcare business? To me, that was everything, right? To come in, and we've only been in two and a half years, and we literally are changing the whole industry. And so I'm proud of that. I mean, it's exciting, and it's fun, and we're just getting started. What are your thoughts on Ozempic? It seems that that's the new yeah, the Hollywood. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but whether it's terzepatide, which is Zepbound from Lilly, or Ozempic, which is from Nova Norse, right? By the way, Lilly just... So there's two ways you can get the diet drugs, right? The GLP-1s is what they call them. And there's two ways to get them. You can get them with the pens, right? Or you can get them with a the vial, right? And if you get them with the vial, they just started um, selling them with the vial this week. Instead of it being $1,300 a month, it'll be four or $500 a month. And so the prices are starting to come down. And if they live up to the billing, again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not the scientist, but if they live up to the billing, it's going to change a lot. Yeah. People crave foods. And if the thing ever got down under 100 bucks a month, Okay, everybody's going to take it, yeah. right? And it's going to, you know, you talk about investing, right? Are people going to eat less food? Yeah, they're going to eat less food. Are people going to be healthier and lead less health care? Yeah, they're going to need less health care. You know, are there going to be fewer heart attacks, et cetera, et cetera? They're going to yeah. be all skinny, though, Mark. Everybody's, you know... I mean, don't we don't we want people of different sizes and different bodies? You don't have to, and not everybody responds the same way. You don't, and you don't have to take it, right? <laughs> you don't have to take it. But you, so I guess if you take it, you try to get skinny, huh? I mean, yeah, but you don't have to, right? right. Right. I mean, there's studies that say, you know, you see athletes, right? Some of these dudes, 6'8", 350 pounds, that are just insane shape and great athletes. Right. Everybody's their own thing. The Illuminati. We, I've had people on here and they talk about the Illuminati. Do you believe in it? Fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> Literally people come on and think it's real? Yeah. Okay, so like, what are the other ones? There's the Illuminati and who are the other ones that are like that? Um, there's like other secret yeah. groups, right? Yes, 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 secret societies. Right? I'm like, I'm rich as fuck. I'm Jewish. Nobody asked me to join any of them secret societies, right? right. Nobody. I'm like, <laughs> hello? <laughs> Can I at least get an invite to a cocktail party? <laughs> nobody. Nobody. I'm like, okay, maybe it's me. <laughs> <laughs> they figure, they, you gonna, you gonna, you gonna uh, uh, blow the lid on the thing, Mark. No, if it's cool. I mean, I've been to many parties. I haven't said shit, right? <laughs> Social media. What are your thoughts on social media? It's I mean, good, bad, good and bad, right? It's not so good for kids anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it's not good when it comes to politics and medical information. There's a ton of misinformation, but I mean, when it's social, it can be great. But social media isn't social anymore, right? You know, maybe some on Instagram, maybe some on TikTok, but even there, right? You post something you think is no big deal and people are killing you, right? They're giving you shit about everything just because they can. And um, there's just no way around that. And even worse, right? 
the way the algorithms work now, everybody's social media feed is different. Yes. You know, yours is different than mine, than different than each one of the folks here. Everybody's different. And so the way things are sold has changed. The way people consume information has changed. We have an election coming up, right? And everybody gets their own feed and nobody knows what's real information. And everybody now thinks the things in like 15, 30 second sound bites anyways. Delonte West, he's fallen on some hard times and you've done several times, you've reached out and tried to help. How hard is it to see someone that, that played for you struggle um, with Brutal. mental health illness? Uh, Brutal, right? Because I thought we had him. I thought we had him turned around. You know, we sent him down to um, Jason's place down in Florida mm -hmm. and it's like a farm, Jason Williams. And, you know, he's like, he's making progress, sending pictures. Dante's emailing me and I'm like, oh yeah, we're getting this. Then Dante throws his shit over the fence, disappears. We bring him back again. Making progress. This is it. Same shit. Only so much you can do. Wow. Yeah, what can people learn from that story? Mental, mental illness is real. It is real, and you just don't wish it away. You don't just rehab it away. You know, I've got other friends, you know, Tanya, these other people that I support and help. Um, you just, you want them to get help, but some things you can't help on everything. You were the shareholder in Twitter before. No, I, wa I wasn't. You wasn't. I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't. You, so what's your what's your um, back and forth with? With Elon? Yeah. Oh, man. I, I just love to fuck with him, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like nobody likes to fuck with him, right? right. So I'm like, Yeah, because cool. he could turn your Twitter off. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, he's got really thin skin, and so it just makes it easy. It's like... He sets himself up, right? When right. when you think when it's your place and it's your business, it's like a club, right? Yeah, come on in, have a drink, and every you just assume everybody's just gonna really, you know, say yes to you, right? Right. Nobody ever says that dinner sucked, right? I just it's just fun. And I, I don't have anything personal against him. And I never initiate it, right? The only time I ever come go back at Elon is when he tries to fuck with me. So like he's called me a racist, he's called me a fool, he's called me all these different names. So he's always calling me names. And right. I don't care. But if you're gonna call me a name, I'm just gonna fuck with you, right? Because it's because <laughs> you're Elon. If it's just some random, what's the point? How important is this election? In 2024. Everything. To me, I mean, look, if you don't think Donald Trump is a threat, you don't think this is the most important election. Um, I do. I just don't. I've known him for 25 years. I don't trust him. Right. I don't think he's moral. I don't think he's ethical. I've seen him rip people off. I don't I don't believe pretty much anything he says. And so to me, you know, I've been trying to support Kamala. What are your thoughts on DEI? On DEI? I, I like it. I think it's good for business. Right. right? Um, you know, I think a lot of people try to misrepresent what it is. But to me, diversity means, you know, good business. Go f look for people where other people aren't looking, right? Not all companies um, recruit at HBCUs, right? Correct. Not all companies recruit, you know, at, you know, different schools where there's a large Indian population or where there's a large LGBTQ population. And so, you know, I want, like any other business element, I want to look where other people aren't because that's where you find smart people. And then once you find those smart people, that they got to be qualified. You're not hiring them if they're not qualified, right? But just some people think like, okay, I hired someone who's black or LGBTQ or Hispanic. Well, they must not be qualified. No, you're not going to hire them unless they're qualified, right? right. So the, the DEI doesn't mean hiring less qualified people. It just means finding people that- A little more diverse. Yeah, we're just, they happen to be diverse, right? You're looking at other people, yes. right? Because you can be as diverse as you want. You can be LGBTQ, trans, black, and Hispanic. But if you're not qualified, they're not qualified. you're not getting hired, right? <laughs> right? That doesn't do you any good, right? right? But I want to go where other people aren't looking. And then once you hire them, the E is equity, right? It means I'm going to put you in a position to succeed. I hired your ass, right? Of course, right. I'm just trying so to I put you in a position. You. Yeah, yeah. And then um, the I, what we're talking about is just, I'm going to let you be you, right? And so being inclusive means if you're LGBTQ, if you're trans, I don't give a fuck as long as you're good, as long right? As you do the job. I don't, right. care I don't what you do. Yeah, I don't care, right? You can be a lumberjack. I don't <laughs> care, right? You can walk around singing a lumberjack song. I don't <laughs> care, right? But, you know, I'm going to make sure people in the workplace, in the organization, respect that. Yes. Right? If, if you know, you're a boy and you want to call yourself Sue, 
I don't care, right? People are going to call you Sue. And some people, they use it as an excuse if they don't get a job, right? right? Oh, it must be DEI. No, I mean, I and you qualify for the either you're qualified or you're not, right? And once you get there, just because you were hired and you're diverse, doesn't mean you're getting a promotion, right. doesn't mean you're getting the next job. And to me, that's what DEI is, and that's why I've been a big supporter. I want to get you out of here on this one. Mark, how hard, because you got married after you had already had some, some paper, yeah. major paper, how were you able to tell that, you know what, she loves me for being Mark? Or do we ever, do you really know? Yeah, of course you know. I mean, if she'll let you hit you with the Dutch oven. You got it. <laughs> no, I made her. I made her go to um to um. Oh my God, I'm spacing out. What the fuck? Um, the little burgers, White Castles. Right. Right? What? I made her go to White. That was the test before we got married. And so I'm going, we're going to White Castles because I went to school in Indiana. White Castles were everywhere, right? Yes. And so I was like, we're going to White Castles. And if you really love me, you'll eat a White Castle burger. She did. Wow. Give me three things that you tell your kids. Because obviously you you want your kids to, to be productive citizens. Sure. You don't want to hand them everything. Sure. So what are some of the advice that you give your kids? Because obviously they know who you are. Yeah. They know what they yeah. what you have, so what they have. So number one is when your friends get drunk, nobody cares, right? When you get drunk, because you're my kid, you're on the front page of the paper and you're all over social media. So always pay attention to where you're at and what you're doing and be respectful, right? Um, number two, you've got, you've got to set your own path. You know, you, you've got to understand that as you get older, you're going to want to de define your own future. So you're going to have to do the work. Like I literally just wrote my son a note to, to that effect. Um, and then just generally, right. And I say this to all kids, um, and all people, right. To be successful, you have to be curious because the world's always changing. You have to be agile. Um, because the world's always changing. And then I, I, was, I also have a couple of really stupid sayings, right? And you asked for three, but I'm going to go further. Um, number one is how you do anything is how you do everything, right? It applies to sports, and I think it applies to life, right? And I'll leave it at that one because that, that's probably the most important because most people, they'll cut every corner that they can, right. and I don't want them to cut corners because, you know, they don't have to worry about money. Is it true that you don't have a chef, a maid, a butler? I don't have, we have a maid, right? So when I travel, you know, I've got different places. I don't have anything there, right? right. So I'll do my own laundry. I'll make my own food. Really? Yeah. So it's like, I have a little shithole in, in um, Manhattan Beach in LA because right. it's close to the ocean and I hang. Um, so yeah, I'll get my own food there. If I'm in New York, we have an apartment there. I do my own thing there. Yeah, but you we do. it up for us, Mark. Yeah, <laughs> but I do. In Dallas, right, we have somebody who cooks my food because um, I try to eat healthy and my wife makes it for everybody else, but she cooks her own food. Um, but we do have we do have people to clean the house. It's twenty two thousand square feet. We ain't cleaning that shit. Yeah, right. <laughs> Last question. I'm uh -huh. gonna get you out of here with this. Anthony Edwards and Magic Johnson. Ant Man said. I saw that. Basically, Michael Jordan was really the only skilled guy back then. Yeah. So it was easy. Long story short, Magic said, "Look, I ain't taking. I don't listen to nobody. They want no titles. No got no titles, right? No level. I ain't Good for Magic, to right? Good so for what, Magic. What, what what are your thoughts on that? Because. You know Magic. I know Magic 25 years. You probably know him a little better yeah, than I do. Probably. But I've never heard Magic go. Go back at somebody like no, that. He's that always super sweet. So yeah. There's Magic. <laughs> yeah, you right. Know, that was Irving. Right, right. That was Irving, right? <laughs> and it's not like anybody else has brought the sky hook to the game either, right? right? You know, with Kareem. And so, look, a, you know, and that's his vibe, right? He's he's going to talk. He's going to talk shit. He's going to stir things up. So I respect that. I mean, he's been great for the NBA because he's just got a great energy to him, right? And he's he's a social media kid, right? right. He grew up with that. So that's the way it works. But yeah, Magic was right in going back at him. And I'm glad he did. Mark Cuban, ladies and gentlemen. This is great. Great Appreciate job. You, yeah, I really Thank enjoyed you, it. Yeah. Appreciate you, I really enjoyed Appreciate it. Appreciate that. Awesome. That was a lot of fun. All my life. Been grinding all my life. Sacrifice. Hustle paid the price, want a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why All my life, I've been grinding all my life, yeah All my life, been grinding all my life Sacrifice, hustle paid the price, want a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why All my life, I've been grinding all my life, yeah